All right. Hey. Hello. You can hear me without the mic. Yes. Hello. 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 Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Good afternoon. Can you look at the person beside you and say good afternoon? I'm so glad you are here. We are so glad to be with you guys. And wherever I have the privilege of speaking, generally, because of our passion to change the world one family at a time, I like to challenge people with this line. So if you can look at the person beside you right now and say, Magbago ka na. Yeah, and go. Magbago ka na. It's been a, a while since we've had the privilege of speaking here in Eastwood, and it feels like home. Such a wonderful place you have here. How many of you are regular CCF Eastwood goers? Can you raise your hands? Awesome. How many of you are attending something like this? You got invited by a friend, first time to attend a family activity like this. Raise your hands. All right. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Welcome here. Thanks for being here. Uh, are you sure you're in the right place? Just checking. Yes. Great. You're sure you're in the right place. I'm just messing with you. So again, my name is Edric, and with my wife, Joy, we've been married for 23 years this year. <laughs> this is our family. If you guys can see, this is our family. We have six kids, and um, my eldest son just turned 21. So, yep, we have a man. Uh, and then our next son is turning 18 in a few weeks. That's Eden. And then Titus, he's um, 15, turning 16 in May. And then Tiana is our next one, our first of the three girls. She's 13. Catalina is 10. And then Kaylee is 5. And I want you to remember those names. Good luck to you. <laughs> because we're going to be talking a little bit about them. But really, the focus of our conversation, as we look at three simple words, which are the following. Safe, seen, and soothed is not going to be so much our stories because I'll be the first to say we are not a perfect family. We are not perfect parents. And I don't think anyone here can say we are a perfect family or we are perfect parents. So welcome to the club. We're all in this together. But what we do have are tools that have helped us. And by God's grace, it has helped us avoid heartache that we see across families all over the world. The one main tool which we have used and used and used throughout all these years is God's word. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to say, what does God have to say about families, about being safe, seen, and soothed in our conversation today? So that after we hear from his words and maybe some stories, some emotional, honest stories with you and some funny ones, we're done. And Lord willing, after that, as I said earlier, we will all leave change somehow. Is that okay? So as we go into this and we look at the words, I wanted to open this properly since our main tool is God's word. Let's give honor to him as we open up and look at his words and see how this will change us today. Is that okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just bringing everybody here. You have a purpose and a reason for every single person here, whether they are regular members and family members already of CCF Eastwoods or they are guests attending for the first time. Some might be even hurting deeply as they're coming into this, this time or they're people who are working behind the scenes who have made this possible. We are all here for a reason. So our prayer is you would stop and silence all the distractions around us so that our minds and our hearts will be ready to hear from your words and that will change us and we will learn how to keep using your tool that you have provided us, your words, in guiding us as we all journey to be better parents and families that will glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So <clears throat> my wife reminded me to credit the source. I like listening to leadership podcasts and one of the leaders I like listening to is a guy named Craig Groeschel. In one of his podcasts, he interviewed a lady named Jenny Allen. And when I was listening to it in the background while I was working out, I, I said, these are great lines. She said, as she was studying people, everybody needs to be seen, safe, and soothed. And so I, 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 that stuck with me and I started talking to my wife about it. And she apparently posted it. And thus, we are here talking a little bit about it. The Eastwood team said, hey, can you talk a little bit about safe, seen, and soothed? But the verse, and this is our own take of these words, the verse that I personally love that we will latch onto 
to talk about safe, seen, and sued are one of two lines that you will see across all of the Bible where God as a father is speaking audibly for people to hear how he's speaking to his son, Jesus. What an awesome, awesome encounter between father and son. Here's what he says. This is version one. He says, this is my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased. I'll read that again. This is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased. And there's so much from this simple line that we can learn because when God speaks to his son in front of everybody, for us to see even today in his words, we need to pay attention. Such a powerful line and a great model for all of us. We're gonna look at these lines and we're gonna take it one by one, safe, seen and soothed, given the way that God speaks to him. And the context here, in case you were not clear in Matthew 3, this is when Jesus finally goes through the desert, the wilderness, he's tempted, and then he starts to get ready for his public ministry. He goes, John baptizes him, and as he comes out of the water, God speaks. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So let's look at the first word. Everybody say safe. Safe. What does this word safe mean? When we see the scripture, when God says, this is my son, there's this sense of, and I'll say it in Filipino, right? Maybe there's a different ring. Uh, Angela, you have kids? No kids. Are you married, single? Single, awesome. Uh, your dad, Job? Is it Job or Job? Job? Job. How many kids? This your kid right here? Oh, not your kid. Okay, sorry. I'm getting mixed messaging right here. All right. So not your son, but uh, yeah, you have one. How old? Somewhere there. I see. I saw you guys pointing somewhere, right? So it's like Job and you see a son? Daughter. Darn it. Okay. Whose son is this guy? Where's your daddy? They're all pointing like, Ugh. all right. Daddy, where's your daddy? All right. So it's like his daddy, the photographer who's busy right there. There's dad. So it's like him saying to, what's your name? What's your name, buddy? Caleb? That's a nice name. So it's, it's like your daddy saying to you in front of everybody, guys, 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 anak ko to. He's my boy. You understand? That's what he's saying. This is my son. I want you all to know. And why is this important? As we look at this first principle, being safe, this is all about asking this question. Do our kids feel secure in whose they are? And that's intentional. Whose they are. Who really owns our children? Who really is their dad? Because as I said, we are imperfect fathers. But they and we have a perfect father. So do they feel secure in whose they are? I love how when, when David writes this psalm, he helps remind us of the depth of this. And maybe many of you are familiar. If you, if you want to really appreciate this, you can go through all of Psalm 139. But I don't have time to unpack all of that. So if you look at this particular line here, it says, For you formed my inward parts, God. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. I'll say that again. Wonderful are your works. In other words, we need to remind our children, Anak, you are perfectly designed. There is no accident. There is no mistake in God's design for you. So do they feel secure in that? And then it goes on. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought. Skillfully wrought. There was no accident in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. God knew us even before we were. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. This is how intimately God knows each one of us and each one of our children. When as yet there was one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. It says, how precious are your thoughts. God thinks about us. Even if there's 7 to 8 billion people on the planet and even people in the past, he knows us intimately. He knows us uniquely. He designed us. And his thoughts to us, about us, are so precious. It says, how vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. So there is someone who's mindful of our children, who's mindful of us and loves us this dearly. And he's saying, you know what? You're my boy. You are mine. So do our kids feel secure in whose they are? Let me give you a practical checklist. And then I'm going to invite my wife to come here and share a couple of things along these lines. Are they secure in their identity as children of God? Are they secure in unchangeables? Are they secure in practicals? So as I ask my wife to come up here, 
I liked setting this up as the first priority because we need for them to feel secure as our kids, although they're not really our kids, we're just stewarding them, they belong to God. But as mom and dad here, they need to feel secure in our identity or their identity as being our kids. But we need to be able to take it higher. And one of the most important things that I have learned in parenting is we need to make sure that our children get to know their true father as early as possible. And as a dad, this makes me emotional because I take fatherhood so seriously. But when I think about myself and my flaws, and I think about how God is as a father and how he's loved me, I feel so secure. And I've been wounded in my own journey as a son because my father, when I was growing up, he was not very affirming. I was the eldest boy and he was a high achiever. So in many ways, I felt the pressure to also do a lot of things. But I was different. I had three younger sisters and to cut the story short, there was a lot of wounds that I experienced in my own journey as a son. By God's grace, he's changed that. We have a great relationship now, but that wound was fully healed when I understood and I got to meet my true father. In my college years, I got to meet this God and accepted him into my life, his son Jesus. And as a result of that, there was restoration and I said, okay, this is the real father I have and all of the wounds in the past, he's been able to heal. So for all of us, the first thing we want to do in making sure our children feel safe is make sure they know that they have a real dad and they need to be able to receive him into their own life so that from that point, the rest can follow. Bib. Sorry, I think I, I came up too early. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay, so thanks for having us. You know, it's such a joy. It's such a privilege. I think the last time we were here was maybe two years before the pandemic. Like it's been a really long while. But it's so nice to see the dynamic you guys have here. It really seems like a big family, which is so special. Um, so what Edric was saying about making sure that our children's identity is secure in God, their father. You know, about two weeks ago, I met this young lady. Her name's Erica. She's probably like early 20s. And um, I, I noticed she was so full of joy. She was just such a happy person. And I started talking to her, asking her about her life. And she said, you know what, Joy? Uh, during the pandemic, I lost both my parents. And I was shocked because I would have never have thought from the way that she was that she had lost anything. She was just so joyful. And I said, well, how did it happen? And she said, well, the first was my mom. We were trying to find a hospital for her to be taken care of. It was during the Delta variant and there was no space. So as we were driving to look for a hospital, she passed away in the car. But, but I said, oh, my goodness. And then she said, yeah, but, you know, one of the things that my mom said before she passed away was, praise God. That was the last thing she said. Not the, not the daughter, but the mom before she expired. And then I said, what about your dad? He said, well, she said, well, about two weeks later, my dad also got sick. And he was able to go to the hospital, but, but he also passed away. And she said, my dad said to us, love one another and serve your local church. And I said, what an amazing legacy. I said, but how have you been coping? She said, you know what? Because my parents raised us to know God ever since we were little. When my parents passed away, I remembered God is my true father. So I didn't feel alone. And I was just so blown away when she shared that story. Because when I saw her so joyful, so full of life, so content even in her current circumstances, and she's taking care of her other sister, but together, they are so secure in their identity as children of God. And the reason why we need to make sure that we connect our children to God is because we never know what kind of storms they're going to go through in their lives. And unless they're anchored in who they are in God, it's going to be very difficult for them to survive and to even thrive. Now, another practical thing is, are our children, or are even us, are we thankful for the unchangeables in our lives? Um, I think the reality is all of us struggle with contentment and being grateful. And I remember there was a season when um, my siblings, because when Edric and I got married, we started off pretty simply. And so my siblings, because they worked for my father's business, they had more financially. And I remember when my kids came to me one day and they're like, Mom, how come our cousins are getting all these new vehicles and they're getting all these club memberships? And I, was, I remember telling them, you know what, kids, we should be thankful 
when God blesses others because he also has good plans for us. But just cultivating in our children that sense of gratitude for their circumstances and who they are. And one of our daughters, our number five, sometimes we label them, where's number one, where's number two? <laughs> so number five, who's Catalina, really, really spunky, energetic girl. And many of her cousins are very fair-skinned because my siblings married um, white uh, um, Americans. <laughs> I'm trying to say, what is politically correct to say these days? Caucasians, fine, Caucasians. So, so one time they're doing the, what is that when you go, um, what is that game? Pompiang? Okay, so anyway, she stretches out her hand and all of them stretched out their hands and she's, she's morena, okay? She's, for me, she's beautiful skin, okay? But she saw her hand there that looked much darker than everyone else's. And she, she withdrew it, and she ran to me, and she said, Mom, because we were at the beach. And to be honest, this daughter of mine, she never wears sunscreen also. So that's another concern. But she said to me, Mom, Mom, how come I'm so dark? And I said, sweetheart, you have such beautiful skin. I said, do you know one time I traveled to... Europe and all my friends were like me they were half you know half European or half American or half something else and the one that everyone found so beautiful was the one one of us that was darker skin like you because Europeans and Westerners that's what they like so honestly I said honey everyone is different and all of us are unique and God did not make any accidents. As Edric shared with you, Psalm 139, when he fashioned each one of us, you are beautiful just the way you are. And by God's grace, it's only by God's grace, she is one of the most confident kid in our family. Sometimes a little too confident. <laughs> We're working on her, uh, you know, her, her character also. So, so things like that, the unchangeable skin color, hair color, family, the time period we're born into. These are unchangeables that we need to teach our kids to really be thankful for. And this is something that my mom taught me that really impacted me. Because I think our tendency is always to compare, to always feel like we're not good enough in some ways when we look at ourselves horizontally. But God always wants to see ourselves vertically, as precious to him, so that we can relate to others properly vertically. And my mom said to me, Joy, here's the reality. There will always be somebody more beautiful, more talented, more capable in certain ways than you are. But it doesn't matter because God has given you everything you need to do his work and accomplish his purposes. So when she told me that, I realized that's exactly what I needed to hear. That God has given me everything that I need as a person to do his will and his work. I don't need to compare. And this is the same thing we tell our children. So... The next part that you're going to hear about, Edric's going to explain, is now the scene part. And I will come back and be seen again and share with you some other stories. But now Edric will explain this context. Thank you. So they're going to be switching. Hello, hello. There you go. All right. So I wanted to add something as Joy was uh, talking about our kids. One of my heroes is a guy named Gary Cox. And... Part of what we wanted to, sh to make sure is clear as we deal with our children is they also need to be secure in the practicals. Will, do they feel protected by us? My daughter the other day, we do this daddy and daughter date day once a month. And you know what that means for dads, right? That means you have to spend a little bit because they like to do things, they're girls. So I went with them and when we were having lunch, we like to ask how we can improve and my daughter Tiana, you remember her photo, she's the eldest of the girl, she's 13. She started getting emotional and she said, Daddy, um, when we do this, how we can improve, I asked them, I said, can you say one thing you appreciate and then one thing that the person can improve on? So they did that for each other, the three girls, including Kaylee, the five-year-olds. And then me, I said, how can Daddy improve? So when Tiana was up, she said, Daddy, one thing you have been doing well, and she started to get emotional. She said, Daddy, you always make us feel protected as your daughters. Thank you for doing that for us. And as a dad in public, I was trying to be cool, right? I'm like, oh, this is so sweet. Thank you, honey. I'm glad that she sees that. But it's so important that they feel protected um, physically even, especially the daughters. Now, provision, the reason I said it's good to remind kids whose they are is 
Provision can be tricky depending on our circumstances economically. And I'll never forget that hero I mentioned, Gary Cox. He's a pastor in the U.S. Uh, he had ten, he has ten kids, right? So that is like sets the bar on a whole other level. And Gary Cox, when I visited their family, changed my concept of many things. Changed my concept of family. Changed my concept of homeschooling. This is when I was exploring the whole thing and changed my concept of American Christianity because I grew up very in, in the more liberal world of America. Um, so when I met him, to cut to the chase, in my conversation with Gary Cox, they didn't have much financially. They had this beautiful farm, but that was it. So with 10 kids, you can imagine, that's a lot of expenses. So he was telling me, he said, Edric, one of the things I've learned is with my children, I need to remind them who their real father is. And in this area of provision, here's what he said to me. He said, when my sons were growing up, they were finishing off their homeschooling years, going off to college. The eldest one said to him, dad, I want to be a lawyer someday. And the dad said, you know what, son, that's great. But I don't think as an earthly father, I can provide that for you. But if God wants that for you, he will provide. And you know what happened to that son? He became a lawyer and even ran for Congress in the district. The second son said, dad, when he was finishing off, he said, I want to be a pilot someday. And the dad just laughed. He said, that's great, son. Honestly, I don't think I as an earthly father can provide that for you. But if God wants that for you, he will provide. And then the son became a pilot. And I love that story because the truth is, if we remind them of whose they are, and if that is indeed God's plan for them, he will ultimately provide for them. Does that make sense? That doesn't mean we won't do our parts as parents. You know, I hustle. I hustle hard. He was doing his part. But ultimately, we need to remind ourselves, who is their real provider? Who is their real father? Are you guys with me so far? Great. So now I'll go to that thing that Joy mentioned. Let's move to the second word. Everybody say seen. Seen. When we look at the word seen, this is what we can get from the verse where we showed God speaking to Jesus. On the one hand, he said, this is my boy. Secure in whose they are. Whom I love. This is the demonstrative part. Seen has everything to do with this question. Do our children feel unconditionally loved? Everybody say unconditional. Unconditionally loved. Where do we see this? I love how the Bible has many different ways of showing just how unconditionally loved we are. For example, I like the NIV version here. It says, see what great love the Father has. What's the word? Lavished. Sobra, sobra in Filipino. The love that He has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Because really, we're not His kids. We're all adopted kids. God has one kid. Who is this kid? Jesus and he affirmed him and he's affirming him right even as we're studying that so what great love the father has lavished on us that we too should be called children of God and that is what we are some of you may know this already but when the word love is used here in the Greek if we were to use the Greek word it is agape which is the highest form of love which is unconditional I love you just because so if we look at another verse from Paul I love how this love is covered here. He says, There is neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. None of this will be able to separate us from the love of God. That's how loved we are unconditionally. And I share that because as a practical application for us, I did share a little bit about my father and the wounds I had. I said I didn't want to go long there. But God restored that relationship. And I will never forget one of these lessons he's given me. You see, even if he was rough around the edges of parenting, we, I grew up in the U.S. He was taking his master's at Stanford. And he wanted to start a life there for, for our family. So I was born there in our first few years while we were there, he was very honest in sharing to me, Anak, you know, because I did not know how to do any parenting, but I love dogs. I used my dog manual to be able to raise you at the start. He was very honest. I was like, that's great, Dad. Thanks for telling me that. Um, but to give you a taste of how he was so inexperienced in parenting, 
I began to understand, okay, that's why it was hard for him to raise me as the firstborn and as the only son. And, and I share this because even if there were rough patches in the way he was raising me <laughs> from the dog manual, he said something, as I said, that I will not forget. He said, Edric, and to my sisters, I have three younger sisters. We're all grown up. We have our own families except our youngest. Um, he said to us, I want you to remember this. There's nothing you can do that will make me love you less. Unconditional love. And I carried that with me. So I knew that even if I messed up and there were times I did, I would get really like the, the wrath of my father. Um, I felt secure knowing that, hey, I am unconditionally loved. Are you following me so far? So have we been able to do this with our kids? Have we been able to let them know that I love you because you are my child? There's nothing you can do that will make me love you less. Now, does this mean if they mess up, Edric, and they do all these things, hindi mo ikohorek kasi nag-mess up sila because unconditional? No, that's not what this means. Let's make it practical. Agape checklist for us. I'll show you the items on the screen that I'll invite Joy to come up again and share a couple of things with us. Do they know we like them even as we love them? Do we lovingly discipline as needed? So the answer to the question earlier is, well, should I just let them go because they need to know they're unconditionally loved? The answer is no. It is our duty as parents to do exactly what the proverb tells us. As the Lord loves us, the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. I want to geek out with you guys a little bit just because this is a new insight I gathered, whenever the Bible puts the words LORD in all caps, I don't know if you've noticed that. In the Old Testament, if you see the words LORD, L-O-R-D in all caps, that is intentional versus just capital L, small o-r-d. Do you know what the difference is? When the Bible was translated from Hebrew into English, the English equivalent of L-O-R-D, all caps, is the actual name of God that the Hebrews did not want to speak because His name was so holy. The closest translation to us was Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh, right? So that's what it means. That's His actual name. If it's capital L and small, small O-R-D, that's actually describing His character trait of being sovereign, the Almighty, the Lord. Are you following? So... When the Bible says, for the Lord corrects those he loves, it's adding emphasis to the fact that his name, this is who God is. And as he is who he is, he corrects those he, what's the right word? Loves. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. So I'm going to ask my wife to come up and share a couple stories how this translates. Okay, I was just reading a book. Can I have it, sweetheart? And it's an older book. I got it at book sale the other day when I went on a date with my boys. And it's called Grace-Based Parenting um, by Dr. Tim Kimmel. And in this book, he said something that was so interesting. He said, you know, love often feels incomplete for our children when, number one, they have to compete for our love. And number two, when they feel like they have to earn it. So competing for our love would be like they feel like we're distracted all the time or we don't prioritize them, or maybe um, we, we, we play favorites. So they feel like they have to always compete for our attention and affection. And then to earn it would be more like performance-based. Like I need to do something in order for my parents to be proud of me. Or if sometimes you can feel like that in your marriage. And to be honest, Edric and myself, we had a long conversation about this last year. Where I said, sweetheart, there are times because you have such high standards for yourself. And I feel like as a wife, I'm not good enough. Because I can't meet up to your standards. And it's only because Edric's really hard on himself. And so sometimes I feel like sometimes, pressure like I have to be at a certain level. And he was very gracious. And we talked about it. And there's been a lot of healing from that. But it's because he grew up in a performance-based household. And a lot of times if we grew up in a performance-based household, then we project that onto our children also. And our children feel stressed and anxious. And I remember there was an incident when um, one of our sons was struggling with some gender questions. Like he's very masculine, but 
he was wondering because he overanalyzes things all the time. He was that one son of ours that wondered, um, do I really love God? Can I really believe that God is real? And then he also wondered if he, if he dreamt about a friend that, that was a guy, does that mean that, that he likes boys? So he had all these questions, you know. And I remember the patience of Edric to really answer them and, and come alongside him because it was an area that I felt like as a, as a wife, as a woman, I think it was really better that Edric would be the one to mentor him in this area. So the, a great thing that Edric did was, because I noticed at first that why were they coming to me first? Like, why were my sons coming? Why were our sons? Our sons, why they tend to come to me when they had a concern? How come they didn't immediately go to their dad? And so I really prayed, and Edric also, God really put it on his heart to have mentoring sessions with our sons. So every Monday morning, even with our son who's in the U.S., they all meet together, and our son, he joins online, and they talk about all kinds of questions like this so that our sons know that Edric doesn't just love them, but he also really likes being with them, and they can communicate and open up to him about any concern they may have. And during those mentoring sessions, Edric covers four things. It's called the four Ps. Um, how are you doing in the area of para? How are you doing in the area of pride? How are you doing in the area of priorities? And the last P is purity. Super important. <laughs> okay. I'm not allowed in those discussions. That's why. Sometimes I try to peek, but they're like, mom, it's boys time. Okay. Okay. So he initiated having these times, intentional times with our children so that our boys understand because we have three boys and then three girls. So as the boys got older, to really make them feel like, hey, boys, I, I see you. I really want to have a personal, intimate relationship with you boys. And how does this happen? In the, when they're together, Edric also shares his own struggles. And so they develop this open communication with one another. And they develop such a love and intimate, intimacy with one another um, that our boys now... When I say, hey, you can also share with mom, okay, what you're struggling with. And they'll be like, I oh, know we're going to save it for our mentoring time. Because, you know, we have our guy thing. So I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> so now that my girls are getting older, then it's my job also to, of course, pour into their lives. But I was just so blessed by that because there was a season when this one son of ours, this same son who struggled with questions about God and identity. And by God's grace now, he's totally okay. He's content in who he is as a man and he's fine because he got to talk to his dad. But there was a season when he was nine years old, when he was really struggling with whether he could believe that God exists. Have any of your kids ever asked you this question? Mom, if God is loving, and if God is good, and if he is also sovereign, and he's all-knowing, then why did he create people who he knows will be sent to hell by him? Has, have any of your kids ever asked you a question like that? So when I looked at him, I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, we homeschool our kids, but they are way smarter than we are, okay? That is just the blessing of homeschooling. They become much smarter than you are. So at the beginning, I was stressed by his questions because I wasn't sure how to answer them properly. So I had to do so much research, read so many books. Edric and I would talk about it. And then Edric would also help answer the questions. And then we realize we have so many children. So how do we minister to each of our kids really individually to make them each feel seen? And so we decided let's take them on trips one at a time. It's cheaper, Deba. Right? It's cheaper, imagine, versus taking them all together. So there was a season when we did that. We really invested in each of their lives and would take them on trips. So we took this one son of ours to Australia and New Zealand. He was with us. He served alongside with us, and he got to eat ice cream every day, and he gained probably 10 pounds because we were gone for almost two weeks. So he loved it. He had so much fun. And fast forward, what we, what we realize about this one son of ours, and you'll notice this about each of your children or even family members, everyone has things that they, they have bents and interests. And we have to learn to get into their world to really make them feel like we enjoy being with them, not just, we, not just that we love them. I honestly think if your loved ones, if we were to ask them, do you think so-and-so loves you, they would say, 
yes, of course, they love me. But if we were to ask them, do they like you? It's a different kind of question. So we want our kids to know that we don't just love them, but we really, really like them. So this is what we would do. So years, fast forward to years and years later, all of a sudden he's teaching a Bible study. He was leading a D group, a discipleship group. And then he said, Mom, there's this one guy in my group, and this is when he was maybe 16 or seven, yeah, 16 years old. He said, Mom, there's this one guy in our group that is struggling with all kinds of questions about God. Is God really real? Does he exist? I said, oh my goodness, that sounds exactly how, how you were. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, how, how have you been able to answer it? Well, he, he explained how he's able to answer it. And I said, Ethan, by the way, remember when you were struggling with all those questions? What changed? Like, how come you're so different now? You're so confident in your faith and you know why you believe what you believe. And he was quiet because he's one of our children who's really a thinker. And he said, you know, mom. At first, I said, I, said, I know. It's because mom and dad, we did such a good job answering your theological questions, right? And he was quiet. He said, you know, you know, I praise God that you and dad always made sure that I know Jesus. But to be honest, mom, and then he got quiet. And then I got quiet also as I listened to him. And he said, you know what really won me over to God? It was your love for me. It was your love and dad's love for me. The way you spent time with me. The way you really made me feel like I was important. And I really got teary-eyed as he shared this. Because a lot of times we feel like we have to lecture, we have to convince our children that we love them. But the best way to do it is just spend time with them, be with them, have open conversations with them, open communication. Let them know that you enjoy their company. And then it becomes easier for them to understand that there must be a God who also loves me and thinks I'm special. In contrast to... Um, the other night, we were counseling this couple, and this guy, he's an achiever. He's, he's, he's leading a very successful company. But when we were trying to explain God to him, he said it's very hard for him to understand how there can be a God who loves him just as he is because he grew up in a home where he had to earn love, where he had to be something special in order to be seen. And so... I think it's a good reminder for all of us. Do our children know that there's nothing that they can do that will make us love them less? And when they make mistakes, do we have the kind of home, even with husband and wife, where if you make a mistake, look, I will not just unconditionally love you, but I will unconditionally forgive you. And maybe Edric can explain more about the discipline part, but here's the one thing I want to say about discipline. Whatever discipline method we implore, like for our younger kids, we would do spanking when they were younger, but they can count on their hands how many times we ever had to spank them because it was few. It wasn't abusive. And then as they got older, it was more withdrawal of privileges or natural logical consequences. So whatever discipline God puts in your heart to to establish, to use in your home, it always has to be restorative, not punitive, not to embarrass them, not to make them feel like they're a failure, but to make them feel like, you know what, we want you to obey because at the end of the day, God wants to bless you for your obedience. And there's blessing in obedience. So honey, did you want to share more about um, discipline? Yeah. All right. So thanks, honey. Um, she actually said what I wanted to say, so I'm done. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I wanted to add, in the area of discipline, as Joy was sharing, we need to understand the heart of God. And that's been the posture we've been taking in this whole time with you. Is God did something amazing in modeling His heart towards His Son, Jesus. And we're learning from that, right? We're on the second one. What's the first one? Safe. The second one is? Seen. As I wrap this up, seen. Let me give you some added tips in the area of discipline because as we've seen in this verse, it's critical. Because God loves us as we are, He will not let us stay as we are. Does that make sense? So if we're doing something that is not according to God's word or if our kids are doing that, because we love them unconditionally, they don't have to do anything for us to love them, we need to be able to also correct that 
as a result of truly loving them. Does that make sense? True love will not let us see our children keep doing what we know are things that should not be done according to God's word. So how do we do that? What is a loving way of disciplining? For parents, what I wanted to add to Joy's options, so we have options. There can be spanking, which we talked about briefly. Logical consequences. So logical consequences are ayo mo kumain, wala kang pagkain. So no meal at all, no snacks. And we've done that with our youngest, right? She won't eat. So I'm like, okay, honey, if you won't eat, there's a consequence. No food, no snacks. So what do you think happens by dinner? Sobrang gutom. She'll eat anything. Logical consequences. The third are withdrawal of privileges. And I think many parents here were very familiar with withdrawal of privileges. Ah, hindi ka pwedeng lumabas, grounded guy. You know, that, that whole, uh, even in our day, that's how we would do, um, experience it. So those would be the general forms. What is really important in the area of discipline, and this is the more important thing, we need to make sure that whatever the consequence, it must be a consequence. Does that make sense? So you can choose from the range of disciplining tools or options. But the critical thing is when you effect this discipline, the child must know this is something I do not want. This is a consequence. Does that make sense? Because if it's not a consequence, then we're just playing games with them. So it's so important that they understand the value of that discipline. Why is it being affected and why they do not want to do it? Are you with me so far? Um, and this is where the heart of God comes in. When we're able to frame it that way, that the reason why you don't want this is because it's a consequence, we're reminding them of a principle that goes like this. We're free to make choices, but we're not free to choose the consequences of our choices. And the more fundamental teaching that we're giving our children is a little bit of what Joy said, obedience brings blessings. It's a chant we have in our home even. Obedience brings blessings. Let's pretend you're all my kids. Obedience brings There you go. And that's so true. Over and over. I've been reading Deuteronomy now in our Bible plan. And you'll see there. God says, if you do this, if you obey me, he uses the word, these blessings will overtake you. When I first saw those words, I encircled it so many times. I said, Lord, let this be the story of my life. I want your blessings to overtake me. But in the same chapter, he says, if you do not obey me, you will be cursed. And the curses will overtake you. Because that is life. This is why discipline is so important. So that they learn early on, if we obey... There's blessings, but if I do not obey, there are consequences. So please make sure that it does feel like a consequence to them. As we wind this down, let's go to the third one. Safe, seen, soothed. After we wrap this up, I understand from our amazing team here that we'll be here to answer some questions. So start asking in your minds, are there questions that you'd like to be answered related to this topic? And we will do our best to give you God's word and perspective on it. Is that all right? Suit. Last word. God in his wisdom, as he's speaking to Jesus, is saying, Anak ko to. This is my boy. Secure in his identity. He is saying, he is my son whom I love. Agape, unconditionally. A great modeling for us. And then he affirms him. He says, with whom I am well pleased. So beautiful. Affirms his son. This is the last principle we wanted to share. Here's the question for us. Do our kids feel deeply affirmed? Are we able to let them feel, okay, you know what, yes, good job. And there's practical things around this. My son, Elijah, are you going to talk about the toxic thing? No, my son, Elijah, who is our experiment, right? He's 21 years old. My wife is a very affirming person, as you know. And if you know her parents, they're also very affirming. Um, side sharing, when I first met their family, and I was playing basketball with the siblings, I thought, this seems like a movie. Do you know the, sa mga kapanahunan namin, in America, there's this show called The Brady Bunch, where everybody seems like they're so happy, and everything's working perfectly, and it seems so artificial, because it's not normal. You watch The Brady Bunch, it's like, The Brady Bunch, they're doing that, right? And so I went, and I met their family, and I played basketball, I'm like, this is like The Brady Bunch. 
it's not real. They're all affirming. Pagka na, na injure, oh, it's, 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 I'm so sorry about that. That's my fault. No, no, it's my fault. I'm like, what? Who does that? Sa basketball, hindi kasalanan mo yan eh. Ganun basketball, di ba? No, I'm sorry. It's my fault. No, it's my fault. I'm like, where am I right now? So very affirming, right? Um, but my son, as a, as a joke, he was like, mom, you know what? I think you raised me with too much toxic positivity. <laughs> Why? So here's a wonderful verse. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as good for edification. Any architects or engineers here? Architects, engineers, great. Sir, what is an edifice? <laughs> Do you say edifice? Edifice, there's another architect, yes. Building, thank you so much. So the word edifice, edification is to build up. Everybody say build up. So the Bible commands us, doesn't suggest, it says, let no unwholesome word proceed, but only a word that, what's it? Builds up. And it says, for the need of the moment. So timing is key. And it says, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So when we speak anything to our children, and in fact to anybody, we want to ask ourselves, are the words we release words that? Come on, guys, a little louder. Are the words that we say words that? Mas malakas dun sa kabila. Are the words that? There you go. All right. Do they build up? Are they according to the right timing? And are they with the right motivation? Because otherwise, even if it sounds nice, it could be toxic positivity. So, practical. Let's get practical as we wind down our time with you and go to our Q&A. First, do we use the right words at the right time with the right motivation? Do we affirm character? Now, one great resource, we like to share resources to people. This is not a Christian author, although a lot of her principles sound like biblical perspectives. And she did research after the pandemic. She's a best-selling author of a book called Unselfie. And she wrote a book after the pandemic called Thrivers. T-H-R-I-V-E-R-S. Her name is Michelle Borba. Thrivers. And in that book, what was impacting me is when she said that when we look at children, there's a difference between self-esteem and self-confidence. Many of us parents feel like we need to give them good self-esteem. Mataas ang tingin nila sa sarili nila. Ang galing-galing ko. Ang talino ko. Ang guapo ko. Ang ganda ko. Ang galing ko sa sports. Self-esteem. She said that is more damaging because it focuses on self Instead, you want to build self-confidence. So you affirm that instead. What is self-confidence? Anak, kaya mo yan. Hinapan ako sa exam. You know, I'm having a hard time studying. Anak, kaya mo yan. You don't say, ang talino mo naman eh. Kaya mo. You, you, you tell them that they can do it. You encourage them to go through the struggle of getting the work done. And once they're able to achieve it, affirm that. That builds self-confidence. I can do this. It's not, I am so good at this. Are you seeing the difference? Very different. And this is echoed by other thinkers. So those of you that are in the corporate world, like nudge my friend here, right? If you understand, there's been another thinker who was a Stanford, uh, a Stanford PhD named Carol Dweck. She's the one that coined the term fixed mindset. How many, of you, how many of you have heard that? The fixed mindset or the growth mindset, right? You hear this lots of jargon about growth mindset. So the, the simple principle behind that is you need to affirm the effort that is being put more than the innate ability. Because if it's the innate ability, ang talitalino mo, ang galing-galing mo, then it becomes fixed. Why is it fixed? They will only look at opportunities around them that will allow them to keep reinforcing that. If I cannot do well here and it will not make me look smart or athletic or artistic, I will not try it. Fixed mindset. Are you following? And that's why I wanted to reinforce that here. Affirm the right thing. So I'm going to ask Joy to come up and wind us down with a couple more stories and then we'll go to our Q&A. So let's please welcome for the last set of stories, the most beautiful woman in the world to me. Yeah, Wait, that's wife. fixed mindset. That's fixed mindset. <laughs> Should be character. <laughs> Thank you for doing your best to look beautiful. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, praise God. All right. So, um, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about Edric is whenever he corrects me, he uses the sandwich approach, which we also learned from my mom and dad. And um, he will say, for example, the other night, I know I made a mistake on something and he was hurt by me. And he's so good at intentionally seeking me out to restore and resolve our conflicts. So he will usually begin like this. Babe, we need to talk. When he says that, alam ko na, okay, nangkamale ako. So he'll say that, then he'll say, babe, please sit down, sit down. So I'll sit down, then he's facing me. He's like, babe, first he'll say, you know that, you know that I love you no matter what, right? I'll be like, yeah. And then he'll say, and you know that I'm so committed to you. And, I, and these are basically the things that he will communicate. He, he's like, I say, yes, yes, okay, just let me have it, just say <laughs> No, but then he'll say, but, you know, what you did the other day, that, that really hurt my feelings. The way you said that and you have a way with your words, that really wounded me. And, of course, I will always forgive you, but I, I just need to let you know as my husband that those kinds of things really hurt me. So, do you see how if that's the approach where you point out something good and something positive. Then you put the meat, which is the correction. Then you end again with something positive and affirming. It's so much easier to receive it, right? It's so much easier to listen to that sort of correction. And so even with our children, this is how we try to um, correct them when they need to be corrected. But of course, there has to be a lot of affirmation. It's so funny because the other day, um, my, my son, so I was having a date with them. Edric was having a date with the girls. And my son said, you know, Mom, um, I know that you're a very positive person, but the, I think the reality is, like, sometimes we still need more affirmation. See, I thought, I thought it was already toxic for me. It's so much affirmation. But how cute of them to say, but Mom, you know what? We really still like to hear you and Dad say positive things about us. Like maybe when we do something or we serve in some way that you could notice it and affirm it or maybe like something in our character. And so I realized, and if you, if you were to think about it, how many of you still want the affirmation of your parents up to now? No matter how, how I'll say use the word mature, mature we have all become, we still would really delight in hearing our parents say, you know what, I'm so proud of you. I'm so blessed by you. And in fact, today my dad's not feeling well. So I brought, I made some congee and I worked really hard to, to make it for him. So before we came here, I dropped it, dropped it off at his house. And he was so excited and so happy and it really mattered to him. And so I realized even to this day, it matters to me that my parents affirm me, that they notice me. And, and to our children, it matters that we affirm them. And that we really think positively of them. And so as I close, well, first I want to say something. What Edric was talking about, when you affirm the wrong things, how it can be detrimental. So Kaylee, our, our youngest, five years old now, she turned five when we were in the U.S. Uh, two months ago. And when we were there, because see, a lot of people have affirmed her for being cute. Because she looks, she's really petite and she has this really cute little face. And because people would always say, you're so cute, you're so cute. So when we went to the U.S., she had a really cute cousin that's like a baby. That everyone was saying to the cousin, you're so cute. Oh my gosh, this girl is so cute. So Kaylee... I noticed she started to cry and she's getting teary eyed. And then I said, so I took her aside. I said, Kaylee, what's wrong? She's like, mom, mom, I think that people think that Camilla is much cuter than I am. <laughs> I don't think people think I'm that cute anymore. I said, Kaylee, Kaylee, I said, first of all, she's a baby. Of course, you're also cute in your own way, but we should be happy. She really is cute, and that, that little baby is really super cute, looks like a doll. But I realized because she's heard a lot of affirmation for the way that she may look physically, like her cuteness, that it became sort of something that made her feel special. And if it wasn't there in the same way, she started to feel insecure. And that's why it's important to affirm character more than things that can fade and can go away over time like beauty like beauty <laughs> so in closing 
When we have an atmosphere where our children feel safe and seen and soothed, and even our spouse feels the same way, I really like to say what Cassie Carson said. Um, he's one of our heroes when it comes to parenting and marriage. And he said that our home should feel like heaven on earth. Do our families feel like this is like heaven? And when we visited my son in the U.S., um, before we came back here, it was like nearing the end of our trip. We had so much fun as a family. And I'll be honest with you, as a homeschooling mom, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is not so much the homeschooling part. It's letting go of my homeschooled kids. So when Elijah went off to college, it was one of the most devastating things for me as a mom. Edric will tell you this. I was like a crazy person. I was crying in the bathroom by myself, you know, like just mourning the transition of letting go of a child that has grown up. And I remember we, whenever we can, of course, we tried to visit him, spend time with him. And so we were all together. We were celebrating Christmas. We were having so much fun, just like the old days. We're all complete, which is like my heaven on earth, you know. And so I noticed that Elijah withdrew afterwards, and he was sitting in the corner as everyone exited the room. And I went up to him, and I said, Elijah, are you okay? He's like, yeah, Mom. I mean, today was a great day. I had so much fun. I just, I just love being with all of you. And I said, oh, are, are you feeling sad because you have to go back to school? Because we met your friends, and you have amazing friends, and you're doing so well there by God's grace. I'm just so happy for you. He's like, Mom, of course, of course I'm happy to go back to my friends, and of course college has been great. But then he said, but you know what? He said, you guys will always be my favorite people. And I realized that when you have a certain kind of culture as a family where these things are present, and they're based on how God is towards us, no matter where our children go, and where they get sent off to, and no matter what their experiences are, it's like they always have this compass where they will always remember home as a wonderful place that they can always come back to. And so I pray that in our family cultures, and if you've made mistakes, it's never too late. You know, we've had to ask our kids many times, how can we improve? How have we hurt you? Will you forgive us? And so the truth is we will all make mistakes. So the key is to ask for forgiveness and to repent and change. But the good news is it's never too late to start. To let our kids really experience this, being, feeling safe in their identity and who they are, not just in the family, but who they are with God. And number two, being seen by us, that we really delight in them and enjoy them. And number three, being soothe. I almost forgot. My goodness. Okay. Being soothed, where we really are also affirming the important things about them that God would also affirm. So I pray that you'll be encouraged, guys, and I hope that we can also have a rich discussion after this. But honey, you'll close it now. Oh, okay. All right. So before we formally close this, we're going to have a Q&A time, is what Chia is saying. So we're going to get some chairs up, and we'll be able to answer some questions, and then we'll close. So... So I need to correct my affirmation of my Hello. wife. Babe, thank you for working hard to stay fit and healthy. <laughs> ah, yeah, and right? Character. Character. Um, great. Hello, and thank you so much for that wonderful awesome. message, Pastor Edric and Sister Joy. We are so happy that both of you are here today. And for our audience for today... It's Nina tonight. It's today. For our audience for today, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand and the people and our volunteers will go, will go to you and you can ask your questions personally and on the mic. But before anything else, we'd like to ask you, how are you guys? And we're really happy that you guys are here with us today. Well, nobody's ever asked us in a q How are we? How are we? <laughs> that's, uh, that's you. I don't know how I am. <laughs> no, we're doing well. We're actually really excited after this. We're going to be doing some fitness stuff together. We love doing that, right? We love playing badminton. And that's how we actually met and got to bond with your own pastor, Ikoi, here. Badminton. He is a mean, amazingly competitive badminton player. At least and in also Jeanette. 
Yes, Jeanette and Chita. That's how we would be play badminton with these guys, right? So how are we doing? We're, we love doing this. We love talking about family, but we're very excited to go to that next thing also afterwards where we can get our sweat on. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very important to be really healthy during this time also. Okay, so we go to our questions. Are you ready for our questions? I have one planted question over here before we ask our audience. So the first question is, so how did you manage to apply these parenting tips consistently, considering that you have five kids also? And on top of that, you also have your ministry, you also have your work. So how was that like? Yeah, first, it's uh, six now. We have a bonus, so it's all right. It's all good. Um, six kids now. How are we able to practice this even as we do the other things? As we said earlier, you know, um, we're not perfect parents. So the way we try and do this is the way that I wanted to close later. So my answer is, wait for it, okay? I have something to say later. That's what I feel has been a way for us to be able to do these things effectively. Babe? Yeah, I, I would just add that I think that's the importance of community also. You know, like you guys, you're a community here. And to navigate something like parenting, which, let's face it, none of us study how to be parents in school. We study everything else but parenting really in relationships, right? So... Um, the importance of community and that accountability, because sometimes we can feel like we're doing things the right way, but if nobody is telling us, right, and nobody's saying, you know what, I think you guys need to improve in this area, then we wouldn't know also. And so that's why community is important. And I think the other thing is that's why it's really important for each of us um, to really walk with God also and really seek after him. Because... Let's face it, in today's day and age, there's so many messages about how to parent, how to even be as an individual, and we really need the truth of God's word to navigate what it means to, to be um, okay in our relationships. And so I would say for me, it's those, those, those two things, um, community, being in the word of God and walking with him, and allowing our children to also, this would be the third thing, allowing our children to correct us and tell us how we can change and improve. That's really beautiful. It touches up on what you said a while ago of having that vertical and also horizontal relationship. Thank you so much. And we will wait for the answer sure, yeah, no, later. I, I wanted to share about how in the badminton court, as a practical <laughs> example, right, one of the guys in, in our discipleship group that I'm discipling, I would play with my son. And I'm very competitive, just, just the way I'm built, right? So when I was playing with my son, who's really getting good, and he messed up. This one game was so bad, like really bad. I was like, what happened? So as we were talking afterwards, I was chatting with him. And then he kind of was just quiet. And then we were getting ready for the next match. Just this guy, my dear friend, he goes up and he goes, bro, um, I don't know if you saw the body language of your son. He was not too happy about that. So I think that maybe you can lay low a little bit on the way I'm like, Thanks for telling me. So that's an example, right, of how that happens in, in real life practice. I wanted to add that anecdote. So, Yes, really the importance of community and having the people around you who genuinely love you. Life like that as well. Yes, truth in love. Yes, thank you. And any more questions from our audience? So we have about time for two questions. So yung mga hindi makakatulog tonight, if you don't get to ask your questions, come on, you can raise your hands. Oh, over here. Up on stage, a microphone will be given to you. Oh, thank you. I am a grandmother. A grandmother, no? Uh, but I have a, a struggle. How can you discipline? The children now, uh, nowadays are so entitlement. They're so, uh, you know, very entitled. Uh, can you give us some practical ways how to deal with them? Thank you. That's, that's a great question. And just to show you how complex that question can be put, no? Uh, grandma, very elegant looking and very engaged with the children. Uh, we were talking to some CCF leaders in the UK. And they were telling us about how bad entitlement is and how challenging it can be in other countries. Because in their case, the children can call a hotline. And they've actually done it for CCF parents who were there. And here's what happened. The parents were imprisoned because the children called and said, my parents were yelling and doing all sorts of things. And so the neighbors heard it, they called, and that's a whole other area of how do you handle 
uh, cases like that. But to answer your question directly then, what do you do about entitlement? It's not an easy answer. But one main thing I would encourage you to think about um, is what are the influences in our children's life? Because a large part of what feeds entitlement would obviously be the influences. So you have to have a good audit, an honest 360 degree audit if you want to be able to remove the root of entitlement or any other character issue, right? So what are the influences? So 360 degree audit in the family, who is influencing them? What kind of messaging? Do they even have enough time with us as parents? Baka yun ang problema. Wala si mommy and daddy and that's why grandma is stepping in, right? I'm looking at you like this underneath the podium. So um, the other would be who are the friends of the children, right? So if you don't even know the friends, then that's a whole other problem. So do an audit. What kind of friends? What kind of messaging are they getting? And then you want to do an audit of the um, exposure they have. So exposure is the whole world of digital especially. You can even use print-based if they still read print, right? But exposure. So if you go to their room, for example, if Edric and Joy went into the room of this grandchild of yours, what would we see? What toys would they have? What books? What magazines? What comic books? Um, what platforms are they engaging on their devices? What devices do they have? What websites have they seen? What music do they listen to? All of that is part of the audit. So then we can see what influences they have because clearly these influences will feed into character issues or entitlement. So once you're able to do that one very practical thing, scanning all of the influences, then I'm sure that the next step will logically follow. For example, ay kaya naman pala kung ano-ano pinapanood nila eh. Diba? So kailangan ayusin natin to. Or kaya naman pala ito yung mga kaibigan nila. Diba? Or kaya naman pala wala si daddy at mommy. Si yaya na ang nagpapalaki sa mga bata. Diba? I mean those things, that first practical audit will help reveal so many influences that, that could be the reason why the child is entitled. Now, another thing, since we've spoken about it earlier, if we want to break entitlement, one very practical thing we have seen is to help our children learn to serve as early as possible. Serve. For example po, yung mga anak namin, di ba? Uh, together with the people in our discipleship group, one of the powerful moments we have had in this past year has been doing volunteer outreaches with CCF's Tulong Tayo programs, di ba? So they do community development and where they've planted some seeds, there's opportunities for D groups to actually go and do outreach, magbibigay ng pagkain, ng ganyan. And having the children do that breaks entitlement because they're no longer focusing on themselves and what they want or what they're interested in. And instead, they see the reality of the need of the world and how they can be a blessing. Example po, one of the kids of our D group who are in that, they're a Filipino-Chinese family and they were struggling with this daughter because strong personality. And she was usually a taker. Pag pagkain, parati na una. Ayaw mag-share, di ba? Kahit siya, yung, kahit siya yung bunso, di ba? So that was her personality. So they were struggling. They were wondering, how do we help work with this child? In that outreach, when she saw the children, and I'm going to get emotional here, when all the children started to fall in line, and then a whole truck came forward with more children because there's such great need. She saw this. She pulled out her wallet, and she gave the money that was in it. She said, here, Tito, I want to help. So I was so touched by that. And when her parents saw that, they got teary-eyed because they're like, alam nila tong batang to, eh, ba? They know how she was very selfish, very taker. So I would encourage you as a, an added practical step, find ways to get the children to serve, to let them see the needs outside of themselves and to be part of contributing to that need so that they get out of me, 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 me. Instead, you how can it be a blessing to others so yeah. i hope that that helps i just want to add too that i think that because if we look at society today people tend to get married and settle down later and so the chances of having more children is also less and usually i call it this this um, syndrome of the golden child where people are having less and less children but economically they're actually more and more well off because they wait longer before they have a family. So what happens it's is less expense because it's only one child. So what happens is when they have this child now that they've waited for also for many years and they can afford to give the child everything. Um, that's exactly what we tend to do is we we give them everything and so that there's nothing anymore to also motivate them 
um, the child. I remember there was this one parent, a very wealthy family, and I was talking to them about homeschooling and talking about how you should have a system of rewards as they, you know, did finish their work. And she said, Joy, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what to reward my child with that will motivate them because I've given everything to them that they possibly could want. And so that really struck me. And I've seen this as a symptom in other families also. So what we have to do as parents is learn to really hold back. And um, less is more at the beginning. And then when you see that they're growing in character, then you can give more things. For as long as they understand what it means to be grateful for the, what they presently have. And I, you know, my, our own sons corrected us on this. Because our sons, when we first got married, we didn't have much. So they really didn't have a lot of clothes, a lot of toys. Um, and then our girls came around. And as our girls came around, economically, we were also better off. So we had more to give them. And as you know, girls love things, right? And moms. And moms. And mom <laughs> Yeah. And so, and you know, one of the ways I would bond with my girls, okay, yeah, let's go shopping, you know. And then, I, and then my son said to me, mom, mom, I, you need to be very aware of this, mom. Mom, you are giving them too much. We didn't have any of those things. M mom, why do you think sometimes they complain and they have bad attitudes and they get frustrated? They feel like they have nothing to wear. When mom, they have so many clothes in their closet. Mom, I really think that you need to scale back. And I became more conscious of it. And so what we have tried to do is um, with, our, with our girls, with our children, don't always give them things right away. So, recent, so we do garage sales in our home because they always like to declutter. And so if my girls will say, Mom, can I get this thing? I'll be like, yes, you will earn it. You're going to help sell in the garage sale. So Kaylee, she came up to me. She's like, Mom, I really want this toy, this Paw Patrol toy. Mom, I really, really want to get it. I'm like, Kaylee. You will work. She's five years old. <laughs> Kaylee, you will help Ate to sell. And if you sell some of your toys and clothes, then you will earn the money to buy it. She's like, okay. So she got motivated. And then there's a different sense of reward. When they work hard and then they receive something that they worked hard for, then they realize, I also want to take care of this thing because I, I worked hard to, to buy it, to earn it. Versus... You, you can have everything you want, and then, they're already, and then they become so discontent with everything that they have, and they still want more. And we're all that way. And that's why, praise God, God knows how to keep us all from being entitled also. He knows our areas of character weakness, and he doesn't give all the blessings right away, right? He prepares us to receive those blessings so that we don't end up preferring things over him. Thank you so much. So that's another checklist a while ago of the entitlement checklist, maybe. So it's all a really it. loaded question. There's so much we want to say some more, but we'll keep it to that for now. Yeah. So like the audit on friends, family, exposure, and also being able to model serving and also being able to hold back and really earning things as well. And being able to see that stewardship, basically, that's also stewardship as well. Okay. Thank you so much. And maybe last question before we go on. Okay, here's the planted question. Okay, so someone sent over their question. I'm just going to read it out. So the points, save, seen, and soothe, were more for showing it to your children. So the question now is, as husband and wife, how do you make your spouse um, safe, seen, and soothe? <laughs> Stay tuned for a couple's <laughs> retreat. <laughs> I'm sure there is one here. How do you make your spouse is Direct it this way instead of this way, right? So let's ask Joy first, baby. How do you feel safe, seen, and soothed? Then I'll speak how that translates to me also. I think it's really important to understand the love language of your spouse because you can be trying to make them feel safe, seen, and soothed, but they feel loved when, let's say, maybe you serve them or maybe when you think of something thoughtful that you gift them with or maybe it's when you spend time with them or... Um, it's when you're affectionate towards them or it's words of affirmation. So Edric has done a great job of studying my personality. And I think this is where we really have to be like investigative journalists when it comes to our spouse. Because the truth is nobody will know them as well as we should know them. In fact, nobody should know them as well as we should. If somebody else knows them as well as we should, we're in trouble, especially if they're the opposite sex. So what, he, what he's done, because he knows that that words of encouragement are so important to me, then that's how he affirms me. And that's how he makes me feel like, hey, I, you matter to me. Hey, you know what? 
um, I appreciate you. So there have been times, let's say, when I'm stressed out with something, and he'll say, don't fear. Edric is here. Or, you know, I mean, things like that. It's so cheesy, but how come I get so kilig? You know, it's so baba, but... You're affirming it, my cheesiness right now. That's good. <laughs> it's Thank because you. I words, that. I it's it. It's because words matter so much to me. Versus the other day, I remember we had conflict because he said something like, I oh, know, you're going to make that my problem now. And I'm like... <laughs> and I really felt so bad. I had a long conversation with him about this. It's oversharing about <laughs> right now. This is oversharing. My What's going on? <laughs> no, to be real, be real, right? To be realistic. So, so, but he caught it right away because that same day he talked to me about, he said, you know, I think the way I said that, even if it may have been true that there was something you needed to get done that you didn't get done and it became something I had to work on, he said, but it was the way I said it and the manner that I said it that wasn't kind. Will you forgive me? So, so I think it's studying your spouse. Being an excellent student of your spouse to know what, what, what matters to them, right? And then responding to that. And it's, sometimes it's something uncomfortable for you. Like in Edric's case, when we got married, he said, you know, the one thing I would really like is for a wife to serve me. And I thought, Lord, of all the things that you could have, you know, that he could have wanted, that was the one thing that I was praying that he wouldn't want because, because hindi ako must service in the same way that, let's say, maybe he grew up with a mom that would do everything for him. And so I remember I struggled so badly because if there's like a, a bottle of water there, he's maybe Just like, oversharing and oh he's my. like, oh. <laughs> so it's exciting. It's like three feet away. He'll be like, babe, can you get me water? And I would be like, in my mind, because we grew up in a household where, you know, what you can do for yourself, you do for yourself. Serve thyself. <laughs> Heal thyself. So, so anyway, so in my heart, I'd be like, is he seriously asking me to get a bottle of water that is within arm's length of him. And, and so I would, I would do it, but my posture would be like, you know, and then I That's would get exactly it. That's exactly your posture. Yes. <laughs> that, you can share yeah. that. You can share that. So, so and, then, and then he said, you know, babe, um, I find it really hurtful when, when I ask you to do something and you respond, but it's like in a disrespectful way that I'm a burden to you. And it's because he delights, he, he gets so excited and so thrilled when I serve him. And where he doesn't have to ask for it, but I can anticipate. Oh, I think this is something that Edric would appreciate. If I made sure that the food was hot for him when he gets to the table. Or I make sure that I, you know, make sure that this area is clean because it matters to him. So that's why I was saying we need to study our spouses. And I'm still a work in progress. And Edric will know this. He's been very, very gracious to me. And now he knows where the water is in the refrigerator. It's amazing. <laughs> So, so, yeah, to wind it down. So, so basically, I would say if you, if you can um, really work on those things, just studying your spouse and responding to it, even if it's not, it's not natural to you or not, not comfortable, um, that will go a long way in making your, your spouse feel safe, seen, and, and soothed. Yeah. So my response will be the way that I wanted to close, which was my promise to answer also the first question you had about how are you able to do this even as parents? I'm going to ask if this is the right time to close it. Is this the right time? So no more questions from you. Okay. And so if you guys want to ask questions later on, please feel free to approach us. We, we love answering questions. And you have a family ministry team here also who would love to engage you. We're very much passionate about engaging and answering your questions so you can approach them. In the meantime, I'll close. Is that all right? I'll close. Um, so my, the way that I wanted to answer that question about which is a godsend because I didn't know that it would be this question, right? How can you do it as a spouse? Um, is the same way I would answer, how is it possible to do this as parents? How, how can we act in a way where our children feel safe, seen, and soothed? I want to close with, I don't know if you caught this earlier, but I said that the words of God the Father to Jesus were in two places. Do you remember that? We only talked about one. The first place was when he was baptized after his 40 days in the wilderness. He's about to go into his public ministry and he gets baptized and God affirms and he says, this is my son. What I found very interesting is the other moment. The other moment that this happens is here. Matthew 17, the other gospels echo this. Jesus is transfigured. So his closest disciples are there and he's changed. His appearance changes. 
Elijah shows up, Moses shows up and this amazing awesome experience the disciples who are with him are basically seeing the true nature of Jesus, how glorious he is and they're like whoa we should do something boss, right? Peter says let's maybe set something up and the reason I share this is in that moment where Jesus' glory is finally revealed to his closest people in his transfiguration, God speaks again and he says the same lines but he adds something. He says this is my son safe whom I love secure, seen. With him I am well pleased, soothed. But look what he adds. What did he add here? Listen to him. Now that you've seen his glory, who he really is, you all need to be changed by this. Do it. The Bible tells us not to just be hearers of the word but to be doers. So when our dear sister was asking, how are you able to do this safe scene soothe with your kids given all the things you're doing, one of the things that I have done is exactly this. This is what the Bible tells us we're supposed to be doing. My job is not just to be listening to it, but I need to, to do it. Do what I've been asked to do. So it's a daily choice. There are times when you don't feel like doing it. It's difficult to be a dad. It's difficult to have children of different ages and, and have to break entitlement. These are not easy things. So the reality is parenting is hard work. But if we do it and we obey what God has asked us to do, we show up, we do what we know is right, then the rest will follow. That's how we're able to do it. It's a large choice to be obedient to what God's word is asking us to do. How can we be safe, seen and soothed? How can we apply this in the marriage? It's the same way. Remember the principle of motion before emotion. I know what I'm supposed to do towards my wife. The challenge is there are days I don't feel it. I get challenged, I am struggling, I am hurt and I don't want to do it. I don't want her to feel safe. I want her to feel unsafe right now because she hurt me, right? But why will I do it anyway? Because my job and my desire is to do what I know I'm supposed to do and then the feelings will follow. If I obey, I will be blessed. Listen to Jesus. Do what he's asked us to do and then everything else will follow. So as I close our time with you, I want to just give a special opportunity to all of our friends or guests or family members who are here for the first time and maybe are hearing about this concept for the first time that, hmm, in order for me to experience the things that God has in store for me, I need to listen to Him. I need to know that. Perhaps for you, the reason why you're not able to listen to him is because you do not know him yet. You have not received him as your father. Um, I'm going to do something I've never done before. I actually will overshare. I bought these pair of shoes and I had them custom made with a number in the back. I don't know if you can zoom in on that. There's a number there. Can you zoom, zoom in on that? Three, one, six. And I said, I'm going to use this someday. And today is that day. If you have not received God and have had a relationship with Him as a father and this is the piece that's missing in your life, for you to be able to apply all of this in your family, I want to invite you to look at a verse that has changed my life and has changed the life of many people. John 3, 16, 3, 1, 6. You know what God the Father says there? He says, I love you so much. I sent my son Jesus for you that if you believe in my son Jesus and what he did for you, binigyan niya buhay niya para sa iyo. Para mapatawad ng lahat ng kasalanan mo. If you receive that and you then give your life to Him in surrender and you make Him the Lord of your life even as is He is your Savior, God will change you completely. He will guarantee you that you can experience life with Him forever in heaven. And guess what? While you're here on earth, you can experience the full blessing of what He has in store for you as a father. So, mga kaibigan, if this is you, as we wind down our time here, if you have not made God your father in that way, you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior in John 3.16, I'm going to pray something with you guys right now. Is that okay? And then we'll pray for all of us that we will all apply what we have learned. We listen to Jesus, that we will allow ourselves to choose to say, okay, I will 
let my kids feel safe, seen, and soothed. I will let my spouse feel safe, seen, and soothed. And apply the biblical principles we learned. Father God, salamat po sa hapon ito. Again, we opened up and said that, you know, there's no accident here. And so we know that you have brought everyone through this time of looking at your words and your son Jesus for a reason. And so we close with two specific prayers. The first prayer is for our, some special guests, friends, family members. Na kayo po nagpadala dito. They're here for a reason. And the reason is so that they might get to know you as their true father. So kung kayo po yun, if this is you, you can make a prayer, this first prayer with me right now, something like this. Father God, I'm so sorry for all the things that I have done in my life. And as I look at these things and maybe even the challenges, itong mga pinagdadaanan ko ngayon, Lord, dahil makasalanan ako, I want to surrender all these things and I now want to receive you as my father, my true father. In order for me to do that, I now believe that what your son Jesus did for me by dying on the cross and paying for all my sins is complete. Sapat na po ito. Wala na po akong kailangan gawin because ginawa na niya lahat. And I ask for forgiveness once again for all these sins. I am not worthy to receive what he did, but I thank you now na ginawa niya po ito para sa akin at tinatanggap ko po ito. I make Jesus the Savior of my life. And as I do that, because of what He has done for me, what you have done for me in your love and sending Him for me. I'm not worthy, Lord, so I make you now my Lord. I choose to make Jesus the Lord of my life. And as I do that now, I surrender my whole life. So that all of these things I've learned here will translate. And so that I can now experience you also as my true Father. This is my prayer. Will you Hear my prayer right now, Lord God. And I thank you in advance for this promise of yours in John 3.16 that if I do receive this now, you will be my Father. And I will experience what you have in store for me here. And when I die, I will be with you forever in heaven. Salamat po, Panginoong Diyos. What an amazing day it is today that I make this prayer to you. And now we pray the second prayer for all of us, Lord God that all of us who are not here by accident will all be changed and that we will apply these principles from your words, that we will listen to your son Jesus and ensure that we are able to treat the people in our homes so that they feel safe, they feel seen, and they feel soothed, whether they are our children or our spouses or any other person in our household, that they feel your love because you first loved us. So salamat po, Panginoon. We pray this in your name. Bless the team here that has put this event together. Bless all the volunteers who are doing this because they love you and they love families here so that we will continue to see more and more families experiencing your love through this wonderful church family of CCF Eastwood and the ministry here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you so much, Pastor Edric and Sis Joy. And may we call Sis Joy to, and, uh, so we can pray for them. Yes. Yes. Uh, but before we uh, pray for them, you know, my family really admire this couple. You know, we live in the same subdivision. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And every morning, yeah, we saw them running and playing badminton. So uh, competitive and really uh, playing like pro. Yeah, true yes, pro. <laughs> yes. I'm yes. also glad that Pastor Edric now knows where the water is. Okay. So I also <laughs> hope that my husband would know where our humper is. Sure. Yes. May hugot, may hugot. Parang. So can we all stand and uh, pray for Pastor Edric and uh, Sis Joy? Lord God, thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for gathering us uh, this afternoon and thank you for the learnings thank you that, that we learned that the more we get closer to you as husband and wife then we can also bring our children to you and no you know lord that we cannot watch our children 24 hours a day but if we connect them to you we know that in the, they are in the right path and lord thank you for this learning i pray for this couple may you use them mightily lord to uh, uh, reach out for people who don't know you, you yet, oh Father, and may they bring to you, uh, get closer to you, and uh, be more like you, Father God, and accept you as Lord and Savior. And I pray also for their family, for their children, Lord, keep them safe, 
as well and uh, continue to grow in your likeness, wisdom, and faith. To you, we bring all this glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And we call on uh, Kyla.